tonight we're going to have Bob uh, WC1N, also known uh, as the Poda Doctor. And the reason for that being this guy has been on, he's been activating Podas every single day since he started on his first one back uh, last sometime last July. Bob can probably give us the exact number when it goes over to him, but I've known Bob for a long time. We kind of lost touch through the years, and then uh, maybe about a year ago, all of a sudden, he popped back up on the radar, and he hit the, he hit the ground with his feet running, and uh, he's running all over these parks all over, all over New England. So without any further ado, I do, we'll let Bob uh, start things off here. We are recording. We'll uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some questions and answers in at the end. So uh, Bob, you go ahead and take it away. Hello there, guys. Uh, Whiskey Charlie number one, November over here in Easton. My name is Bob Fackerson. Been a ham for forty years. Uh, like Pi said, we used to be uh, almost neighbors in Abington a long time ago. That's how we met on CW many many years ago. And then family and jobs and flying out. I was a pilot for several years flying out of state and so forth, didn't have much of a home life. So needless to say, uh, when COVID struck back into a ham radio, I came after I donated all my equipment to Whit Whitman Amateur Radio Club and uh, found out there was a digital age and tried digital and didn't particularly like it and then went right back to CW. So what I'm going to do tonight, guys, is uh, just give you some do's and don'ts on some portable operations. Not that I'm an expert, but... Uh, the stuff that I've learned, I'd like to share with you guys, and I think you might find it interesting. At this time, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. This is Pox on the Air. That's not necessarily everything I'm going to talk about tonight, but it's basically uh, set up portable stations out in state parks and wilderness and whatever it might be. And uh, we'll start off here. This is just some of the statistics, who I am. I've done a little over uh, 13,000 contacts in the last, oh, I don't know, 10 months or whatever, mostly on CW. Do it every day, enjoy it quite a bit. Um, the first thing I want to start off with is uh, portable operation. I'm going to emphasize on safety. I'm going to show you some minimum equipment required out in the field and also show you some special surroundings that uh, makes it all worthwhile. This is an activation I did down in the National Seashore, down in Cape Cod. And right toward the end of the video, I would like you guys to take a special look at my antenna and think about what mistake I made. I'm sharing my mistake with you. Hello there guys, Whiskey Charlie, one November. I'm down here at the end of Cape Cod and I'm at uh, the National Seashore, having a little bit of fun with the sand dunes in the background, as you can see. And it's K0672, uh, operating on 14059.5. Having a little bit of fun, I just wanna show you around. Just a bunch of sand dunes and cloudy skies. There's one little house up on the sand dunes there. Having a little bit of fun. Uh, the way we're activating today is a simple way that we do in the winter time with the big red truck. And, and then uh, I've got the 17 foot whip on the top of it for 20 meters. So that's all there is to it. And everybody who's contacted me, thank you very much. And uh, hope to reach the rest of you. See you later. Whiskey Charlie, one November out. Now, maybe somebody didn't catch that. I'm gonna show you the mistake that I made. I'm backing the video up a little bit. Look at that antenna and look at those wires. I don't know what the space was between the wires and the antenna, but at the time when I erected that antenna, I did not even look at it, and I should have. So when you deploy your antennas out there, whether it's down the Cape or out in the woods or in a state park, certainly uh, take a look around. I mean, again, I don't know what the spacing was, and I actually realized this after the fact, and I said, wow, that is, that is close. I should have probably moved the truck further away. And also, not in this case, but it certainly could have been. I could have been susceptible to some uh, QR Nancy. So that's uh, one thing that we want to stay away from. Again, I'm showing you some safety aspects of it, just so we're safe before we have fun. You never know what you're going to run into. These state parks, the park I was with today was a great place for a murder. 
It's a long dirt road out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody even hear you ever a gun went off. So just be aware of your surroundings. Uh, there was a period in my life I worked with the State Police Drug Task Force, and one of the first things they uh, insisted on, always know your, your surroundings. You never know what's going to come up behind you or beside you or even right in front of you. This happened to be a, um, a park that I did up in Maine, and right on the side of the road, and there was a massive drop-off right there. So here you are, you're out there doing a selfie or whatever you might do, and you're not aware of it, and uh, you might go over the edge if you're not uh, aware of your surroundings. Here's another perfect case. This is up in September up in Maine. Happens to be a black bear up in the tree. Again, know your surroundings. Um, Bill Brown, he's the polar operator, CW down in Florida. Less than two weeks ago, he was setting up a station down in one of the parks in Florida. And up out of the pocket brush, a, uh, a panther walks out in front of him six feet away and then just continues on and goes into the brush on the other side. He picked up his equipment and went to the next park. Know your surroundings. I was at a state park up in Jackman, Maine. I'm way out in the, way out in the woods and um, all by myself. I had my headphones on. And all of a sudden, this dog, and originally I didn't even know if it was a dog or a coyote or what, just came right up to me just as I was on the air and I didn't even hear him coming. Luckily, he had the vest on, so I knew it was domesticated animal. And then uh, five minutes later, the, uh, the, the, the lady and the daughter in a baby carriage pushing down on a dirt road out in the middle of nowhere. I have no idea where she came from. She never said a word. Just, again, know your surroundings. Just want to emphasize a little bit about lithium phosphate batteries. Um, I did a lot of training. We had to go for training pretty much uh, if you were captain every six months, if you were first officer every year. And one of the major things in aviation is the lithium phosphate batteries. Because when you're on board, what happens if somebody has a laptop and it starts smoking on you? How do you handle it? And it can actually go into flames. Well, lithium phosphate batteries, they do not respond to a fire extinguisher. They do not respond to water. The only thing you can do is blanket it with, with ice and cool it down. And how serious it is, if the aircraft had lithium phosphate batteries as our main batteries for 24 volts in the back, if they started overheating, we would mechanically disconnect and go to emergency power. And we, instead of landing as soon as practical, we might have to land as soon as possible. That meant on a highway, because once they start melting down, they will go right through the fuselage of the aircraft. So again, hopefully it never happens, but if one of these lithium phosphate batteries starts heating up and you see a little smoke, disconnect, get away, they're, they're, they're dangerous. Uh, again, your surroundings. This happens to be a flight that I had, uh, I, I don't know what 44 November is right now, I'm guessing it was down in New York. And look at the flight path that we had to fly that day down into Norwood we had some uh, pretty serious thunderstorms in that area right along our whole path. So again, uh, some is coming up, hopefully. You're out in the field, you set all your equipment up, it takes you half an hour to set your equipment up. If you're not aware of the situation, what the weather might be, you might get caught and your, your equipment might get wet. So again, be aware of your situation. <clears throat> We're gonna run into some uh, minimum equipment now. And, uh, I worked the gentleman, I guess this James Nichols, I don't know what his call was, but I worked him and never knew that he was operating uh, with this little key here that somebody made out of spoons. And I guess um, the Cub Scouts were doing it for a merit badge and I told him I'd help him with it once they're ready. But uh, again, key here. You don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need a truck. This just happens to be a car that's it's my car that's, I don't know, it's 25 years old almost. It's like new, but it's 25 years old. Here's a tuna, a radio, a battery, keyer, microphone, and uh, antenna on top of the car over here with a magnetic mount. And you're on the air and you're, you're talking around the world and you're having some fun. This happens to be on Fort Revere down in Hull. 
which is a state park. It's got some elevation to it. In the summertime, there's a beautiful breeze there if you can catch it, you know, after uh, the sun is going down. It's beautiful. Now, who would not want to activate here? This is Massasoit State Park. Middle of the day, you're underneath a tree, nice and shady. It's a beautiful atmosphere. There's nobody around. Most of these parks are empty during the daytime anyways. Same scenario, here, radio. This happens to be an 891 and uh, the uh, LDG tuna. And my, uh, this happened to be an old car battery that I had that I used uh, that I used for my bees out back before I bought my uh, lithium phosphate that I'll show you later. Uh, a lot of people talk about generators. I, I purchased this gener generator because I go up north and I try to activate once a month up there, even in the winter you'll see in future um, photos. And somehow you gotta charge the batteries. Where I had gone up north, I was 33 miles away from a paved road no Wi-Fi, no cell coverage, nothing. So what I would do was I would deplete my batteries during the day. And then at night, I would, uh, as I'm going to bed, I would start this generator up, hook it up to the battery charges and charge my batteries. And I would program the Ryobi to, uh, to shut off in four hours based on the computations that would fully charge my batteries. So the next day I would be good to go. And, and uh, it, you know, these generators, the prices have really come down quite a bit. This one I think was uh, under seven hundred dollars, and it's all controlled by your iPhone. It's just it's it's incredible. Uh, the Ryobi I used to think they they were uh, low end. This happens to be very very nice. Again, this is up in Maine. You'd never ever see this dam out in the middle of nowhere. This is the Windsor Dam down near the Forks, and this is. Uh, a place that I just went to and I said, wow, just out in the middle of nowhere. And it's this beautiful monster dam. Just again, this is the advantages of uh, special surroundings when you're doing these powder or even solar activations. This was field day, same scenario. I have an antenna on the back of the truck that I'll show you in a little bit. It doesn't have to be a purchased one. It can be one that you can make, very simple. Radio Kia copying down the call signs, headphones if you want. Same scenario. Now, this, this happens to be up in Maine. This is one of the early uh, camping uh, trips that I made onto to a lake up there, Sub, uh, Sabumic Lake. It was never activated once. This is the one that's 33 miles in from, uh, from Rockwood. So I decided I'd go up there and I'd activate it. And uh, I've been drawn to it ever since. First time, I guess I'm the only one that's ever activated. I think I've been up there four times um, and maybe a couple of days each time. Uh, we talked about, you know, minimum equipment list we need. This is a fan dipole. Now don't think that you have to go out and buy any special equipment. Everybody's got some wire at home probably if not, you can go to your local box store and grab some wire. And the way it works is, it's just like it says in the handbook. It's 462 divided by the frequency in megacycles. That's the length. If you're not, if you're not into uh, you know, feet and inches, you can go 300,000 meters divided by the frequency in meters, and your result will be in meters. But it's the 462 makes it easy. And then from there, You'll be in the ballpark, and then if you have an antenna analyzer, you can tune it a little bit closer, and you can get pretty close to a, almost a one-to-one -one match and a very highly efficient antenna, and uh, you'll be very happy. This was a uh, little PVC pieces of uh, AZAC, you know, the plastic wood you can buy these days. I made some little strips. I drilled a couple holes for the spreaders. This, this particular fan dipole I made operates on 20 and 40. And again, this, this particular one is down at Beaver Tail State Park. Another beautiful place. Pull your car, truck out in the field. You own it for the day, if you'd like. Um, if, you're, uh, if you'd like something quick and easy, I do this quite often during the week when I don't have time on the weekend, uh, until the weekends. Magnetic mount. This happens to be a 17-foot MFJ telescoping whip. It works very well on 20 meters. 
and it loads up on anything in 20 and above with an antenna tuner. And what I do is I clip on with these uh, alligator clips and I run a wire that's 17 feet, more or less like a counter pose. You know, it works out. I think the low is the SWR a little bit and um, I think it's more efficient that way. Now, people say you gotta, you know, height is might and all this. Well, I've done this long enough that I can make contacts with an antenna practically on the ground. And here's a perfect example. This happens to be uh, Borderland State Park during a snowstorm. I think it was the beginning of the blizzard actually. Good morning, guys. Whiskey Charlie, one November, Borderland State Park. K2420, Massachusetts, snowstorm, Friday. I believe it's the 7th of January. Just want to let you know how we do activations up here in the wintertime. <laughs> I don't think you can see it quite well, but uh, this is my uh, beginning of my end fed dipole there. And it comes all the way up here, up, 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 up. And it comes right up to my truck. Now, people say, what's this bag? Well, that's protecting my ballon from moisture. And I've got a choke in there also. And the coax comes right back to my truck and then comes into my truck. And here we are, still snowing. Going to get about a foot of snow. And here we are. Got the tuna. Got my 896. Got my Kia. And I'm ready to rock and roll. Whiskey, Charlie, 1 November. Now, on that ballon with the plastic on it, I've noticed and I've actually spoke to the engineers at Chameleon Antenna. When it rains out or snows out and moisture gets to the ballon at that joint, a little bit of moisture raises the SWR quite a bit, and that's why I put a bell on. They are coming up with, or maybe they've already developed it, a total heat, uh, heat shrink tubing around the whole fixture. So possibly in the future, nobody will have to do that. And most people don't activate in the rain. I just happen to do it every day. Another uh, simple antenna, if you choose to operate on two meters of 440, this is a Yagi that I use for... Uh, satellites as well as the space station. And uh, when satellites go overhead, you basically have a maximum time that you can work them of somewhere close to, if it's an overhead mass, some, somewhere overhead pass, somewhere around 10 minutes. So you don't have time to write down the grid square. You don't have time to write down their call sign. And I'm not good at that anyways, doing it very quickly. So you got one radio down here on the transmit up, you got one radio for the receive coming down, and then I have a recorder also. It records everything. When the pass is all over, you go inside and you decipher what, who you talk to and write all it down for your log and whatever you like to do. It works out well. I use this same antenna. I've used it once on a summit on the air. I don't know that I'll be carrying up to a summit high, but I did use it over in Quab and it worked out quite well. I did summit to summits up in New Hampshire. Another uh, photograph, this happens to be down in uh, Jamestown, Rhode Island. I have a, a two inch by two inch hitch out of here. I had my welders weld out a three foot two by two and up five feet two by two. I put a pivot point here. This um, 24 foot two by four that's ripped down, lowers down. I pull it back up, it's a pulley up here and I hoist up the fan dipole and put up a couple cement blocks at either end and I'm on the air. Again, it doesn't cost you anything. You can make it yourself. This is on the Appalachian Trail. Um, they had Appalachian Trail Appreciation Day last summer and I decided to go out to where I do all these activations pretty much by myself. And here I am. I'm out here talking to, uh, to Pi and the guys in Braintree. And uh, I'm at the Appalachian Trail and I'm just sitting back relaxing, no pressure whatsoever. Everything's great. Now, this is the QRP radio, this is the 705. And I'm at the Appalachian Trail in Lee and WI1G is located in Braintree. 
and we're going to call. He's basically helped me out quite a bit as like a ground crew. Uh, when I couldn't activate or couldn't uh, spot myself, uh, John was always there for me every time I go out in the wilderness. Uh, Whiskey Italy won Germany. Do you copy? Whiskey Charlie won November. I sure do, Bob. This is Whiskey Italy won Gulf. Yeah, how, what do we got for a signal report? You're five nine plus here in the Appalachian Trail. Go. Yes, here a solid five nine coming right across the state to the South Shore. Okay, QSL. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a great night. QSL at the frequency. Whiskey Charlie one November. So there you go. That's pretty simple. Bio Eno. Uh, Kevin's the owner. He's in California, and um, pretty much mention uh, you've heard that the first purchase is 10% off and they'll give you 10% off your first battery. He's a ham himself. He'll size up what you need based on the radio. Some of the new radios like the 705, any of the software defined radios, they don't take much uh, current whatsoever. So you'll be surprised how small a battery you can have. We talked earlier about an antenna analyzer. Here's one I had for the fan dipole. Before I did my activation for field day, I made it one night. I uh, spent a couple hours out in the driveway. And here we are, look at this, right down to 1.16 to one. And it was right at the top of the uh, CW band on 40 meters. It was just exactly where I wanted it. And it's just, here we are, just a piece of wire on a coax and you made it yourself. It is just, just waiting for somebody to go over there and sit down and I mean, who would not want to activate right here? Put up a vertical or tie your, your end fed to one of these trees and back to the picnic table. You can sit back here and work the world very easily. Naturally, uh, everything you do, you're going to write down with a log. And uh, basically, the, the, the time, I usually do the number of contacts until it gets out of control. And I keep going with pileups, the call sign, signal report. And any notes you might have the state or if they were operating Q, QRP like N4DJ, he's a, a gentleman down in the Carolinas. He's a, he's a retired um, RF engineer, I believe, and he's, he's absolutely fantastic. And here's a guy to speak to about antennas or any type of RF systems. He's wonderful. Just a hat that I had made. Got a couple of people to make these for a very low price. Here's an activation up in that Sabumic Lake I was telling you. This is two o'clock in the morning. We have all the light pollution down here. You don't even know what's up there. This happens to be two in the morning and I just took my camera and said, bingo. Let's take a couple pictures and see what it looks like. I don't know what these objects are. They're probably a, it could be a star or a planet, I'm not sure. Now I wanna play this video. Now naturally when I go up north, um, my friend Pi, I call him the mother hen. He's always giving me suggestions and we rib each other back and forth. Listen to this carefully. Hi, you told me if my batteries go dead to look for a windmill and at the base of it would be a 110 plug. I've looked everywhere and there's no plug. I need your help. Just kind of a fun thing. This was a wind farm up in Maine. It was a series of, I'm thinking about 15 windmills on top of this uh, mountain. It was just absolutely beautiful. And these are the dirt roads that I would be traveling up in, up in the wilderness. You can see what they look like. This will give you a little idea what the roads are like up here in the West Branch of Maine. Now imagine traveling down the road like I am right there. And around the corner comes a logging truck. And he's going twice as fast as you are and imagine it in the winter. Well, WI1G and myself, we went up there uh, in the first week of February and this same thing happened. A logging truck came around the corner. There's four feet of snow on the ground. The roads are poorly plowed. It's snowing out. I pulled over to the, the far right. John pulled over. John got stuck. The logging truck went by and then luckily I pulled John out. We continued. It's just, uh, it's exciting, but it's wild up there. They're all dirt roads. I'm going about 25 miles an hour. I guess you could go a little bit faster. 
And look how beautiful that is going to Yapota. And this happens to be, I'm going to stay up there for three or four days away from everybody. Just so beautiful. This will give you a little indication what it looks like in the winter time. This might have been when I, I camped up there uh, the week before Christmas. Uh, this was, uh, again, Sabumic Lake. This could have been in, excuse me, possibly October. Again, simple, real simple, battery, transmitter. This case, I had the, uh, the vertical mass I had in the back of the truck, and I put the, uh, the fan dipole on this, and it worked out wonderful. Uh, this was a different campsite up there, same exact scenario. Just beautiful. What I do is I bring some solar panels to a halogen light. Well, actually, it's an LED light, I should say, but it looks like a halogen. And at night, this will light up this whole area. And, you know, you, you got to think about animals up there. You know, I haven't heard of anybody being attacked or anything, but there's animals up there you've got to, just got to be aware of. You're in their territory. Now, this is kind of a funny story. I was doing a soda. I think two weeks ago, and needless to say, I spoke to my mother hen, Pi, prior to going up there, and he says, jokingly, he says, Bob, you've got to get yourself a goat, just like the gentleman out in the Rockies that climbs the mountains out there. And I said, and I laughed, and I went away. And then five minutes later, there's a lady walking down the street, and she's got four dogs on this little narrow dirt road I'm traveling. I said, hey, do you mind if I take a look at your dogs? And I just want to stop and say hi. Yeah, but they're not all dogs. Well, the next thing I know, one of them is a goat. And I said, hey, can I have a picture of that goat with myself? And who do you think I sent it to? Oh, I sent it to Pi. He says, you got your own goat. This is just up in Lily Bay where I camped. Um, this is, uh, I think this is, this is an activation during another snowstorm. Hello, guys. I just finished my activation over here at uh, K2420, 20 miles south of Boston. Got a foot of snow, two feet coming, 60 mile an hour winds. Away we go, I'm gonna reverse, uh, hopefully. And uh, well, I guess I can't do that. But anyways, I was gonna show you the antenna setup and everything, but there's the truck, there's the plow, there's the antenna, and we're all good. And I just made my activation, so I'm happy with that. And the guys that checked in on CW, hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Here we are, Whiskey Challenge 1 November, another day in bright, sunny, sometimes New England. Now, people ask me all the time, what about the weather? Does the rain or the snow affect your signal? I don't think so at all. I guess it, uh, I spoke to one RF engineer and he said, because of the size of the molecules and the RF energy has no effect. And uh, I've never seen any effect whatsoever with weather other than you know static in the summertime or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know what this is. Uh, just this is my 891. This might have been a contact up in. Uh, I speak to a gentleman up in Alaska on a regular basis, N NL7 Victor. And for some reason, transmitting from this location to Alaska, it just must be just the way it works out perfectly in 20 meters. I speak to Alaska and CW from Potter every single week, guaranteed. Uh, here we are down in. Uh, I'm down at Fort Phoenix, down at Fairhaven, Massachusetts, and I'm right on the water. A beautiful, warm morning. I set up there. I operate for three or four hours. Just sit back, have a cup of tea, and just relax. It's beautiful. This just gives you a close-up of the mask. You know, these uh, eye bolts. Basically, I take one eye bolt out, and it rotates on this one. I disconnect everything at the ground. And then I take out the second eye bolt. This long pole goes on the roof of the truck. And this uh, vertical L shape goes in the back of the truck. Uh, camping out. Um, this is probably September or October up north. Trying to keep the fire going as long as I can to keep whatever animals away. This was an activation that I did with the John WI1G. He loves camping. He's, he's done a lot of it. He's probably done quite a bit more than I have. He's definitely an expert on the outdoors. Neil to say, uh, this was the first week in February. It was cold, but not as cold as it had been. So we decided 
well, if it's only going down to the twenties, let's go. This is going to be great. So he's got an ice house like I do. And we both set up ice houses at Lily Bay. And that was a state park. And uh, this is an indication of my end fed dipole hooked onto the truck. And it goes out and it's literally three feet or two feet off a snowbank and uh, work the world with it easily. Uh, this is just a little video that shows put, putting it up. This was done, uh, this was a week before Christmas. This is, uh, we had about a foot of snow on the ground. I just barely made it in because they don't plow the roads. And that was the only thing that bothered me was I wanted to get in and get out without it getting stuck because who's going to rescue you up there. So I set up a little table in there and uh, here I am, I'm on the air and uh, it, it's cold. But I have a little buddy heater in there. I keep the heater going during the daytime. At nighttime, I shut the propane off on the outside. And uh, when I wake up in the morning, there's literally three feet of ice on the inside up the wall because it gets very, very cold. This is the same look in uh, September or October. It looks like October. This is Sabumic Lake itself. They used to put the logs in here and in the spring, they let the dam go and float them down. They stopped that, I guess, in the early 60s. Again, just uh, basic dirt roads. These are just, for whatever reason, I, I work Alaska quite often. And uh, they're all nice guys up there. They're, they're running high power and their beams and everything, but that's how they operate up there. That's all they have to do in the winter. Uh, Moxie Falls at the Twin Fox. Uh, that, that was activated before, and I, it was never activated with CW, and I did activate that several times also. Again, know your surroundings. I didn't dare walk on any ice whatsoever when up there. I, I don't care if they tell me it's three feet deep. I'm still not walking on there by myself. Uh, here's another scenario. Talk about special surroundings. I just did this last Sunday morning also, because it's one of my favorite places. And I think Pi likes it quite a bit also. This happens to be a Fort Revere. So I'm in the parking lot up there and I'm doing a polar activation. And this is what I have to look outside. And I'm sitting out there, it was a tugboat here and a tugboat and a big uh, barge came in. The tugboats just pushed it right down the, uh, the harbor there. It was just absolutely beautiful as I'm sitting back doing my radio. So it's like you're in heaven. This was down South Beach, Cape Cod. I did a little different scenario on this one here. I did the vertical. And then at the top, I bought a bracket to hold my 17 foot whip. And then from this point on, I attached it to the outer shield and came down 17 foot. So I, I basically had a quarter wave vertical next to the ocean. And I think the ocean does help. I wish I could have a ground into the salt water, but I never, never have. And that works out pretty well. The, the angle of uh, radiation is much lower. So if you're lucky enough in the very early in the morning, when the F layer is becoming ionized in the beginning being ionized, it's a great time for DX into Europe. And then once the uh, F layer becomes saturated, uh, then the uh, propagation starts decreasing in midday until we get that gray line. That's why, you know, you see these maps with the gray line, it's so important. Well, it's very important for our propagation. And that's, uh, if you want Europe or anything uh, up or down the gray line, that's the time to do it. Around this time, right now, it's about 8.30 in the morning. And actually, it changes in the summertime. We're right on the border. When I hike up there, I'm 50 miles southeast of Quebec City. I guess you could go right into Canada without any problem. There's nobody at the, the dirt roads. You could actually just drive in there, I'm sure. Again, the ice house. Cost of the ice house is, I believe it's a little under... If I remember correctly, it's somewhere around $600 plus or minus. There is an insulated floor and it's, it's not, it's a plastic with some type of insulation before in between. It doesn't really do much. That was the only thing that was cold was my feet. They were always cold. Again, Sabumic Lake, fall, it's beautiful. Wilderness. 
not much soil up there. Everything is all, uh, because of the glacier, everything is all rock and this is all hard pan. Uh, years ago, we had fished in here and uh, the fish are hungry. I mean, at the time my son fished there and I think he dug up worms or something and threw it in there and immediately caught trout. So the fish, they don't, uh, they don't have too many people up there fishing in this area. So they're hungry. Again, the dam out in the middle of nowhere, downstream from the dam. Now it gets a little airy at sunset when the sun goes down, you're up there by yourself and you know, you keep the fire going, but you know, it's, it's a special, it, it's a special feeling when you're by yourself out in the middle of nowhere. I have a question about the dams. Sure. Uh, I've been up in the Golden Road quite often. It's kind of yeah. scary up there if you, yeah. uh, if, right. you know, you break down or anything like that. But uh, right. uh, are those dams, they used to be used to serve the paper mills, but a lot of those paper mills are gone now. Are they, yeah. are they taking uh, regular power from them now? This is set up to take power, but I don't see that they, they've got a, a house over here that they're taking power, but I don't see that where the power goes. The previous dam was the Windsor Dam. And the Windsor Dam does produce power. I don't, the Sabumic Dam, and I don't know, you're probably referring to the Ripidamus Dam up in the right. Golden Road. Ripidinus, yep. Ripidinus, yeah. That could be producing power. And okay. Great Northern Paper gave the road to the state. So basically, the state is supposed to maintain it. So that's all I know about that, right? I did not, I have not been up to the Rip Dam for, uh, you know, several years. When was the last time you were there? Oh, you got muted. Henry? I was going to say, we uh, last time was 1993. Uh, we used to go up every year. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I often wonder what would happen if you broke down on the Golden Road. It's so long and it's so empty. Well, what I do when I go up there, um, I bring double of everything. I bring double transmitters, double uh, keys, double coax. Uh, double ra radios, antennas, uh, the heater. In the winter time, I've only got one heater, unfortunately. But usually, I back myself up with everything because you just never know. You just never know. I had a, a funny story I'm going to share with you because you brought that subject up. This is the first time I've been up there in 20 years, and I prepared myself with firewood, mat, uh, firewood, and everything. And then I said, "Well, I'm not going to light the uh, firewood." of the, the, the actual um, campfire until the very end of the dock. And son of a gun, I, 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 I go to light it and the lighter that I have has no fuel in it and it won't light. And I said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Now I'm in trouble. So I tried the cigarette lighter. Cigarette lighter, well, after six tries blowing on a Kleenex, it burned the fuse. So now I had nothing. And I just luckily had been given some kerosene earlier from one of the, uh, the guides up there. And he just handed me, he said, you're going to need this. Trust me. I said, I don't think so. You're going to need this. Trust me. I put a little bit of the kerosene on the Kleenex and the spark ignited and I had fire. Other than that, I, the first night up there, up by myself and being up there 20 years, I'd have no fire. And at, at that particular time, I didn't, even, I didn't even bring a gun that time. So it's just kind of a funny story. beautiful campfire and here's the kerosene over here this guy handed me this and he says you're going to need it i had no idea i was gonna and there's the lighter that was defective funny story now look at this here we are here i am up there camping look at these stars i mean it's just it's paradise and if i wasn't interested in ham radio or doing remote uh, activations i would never have been here I took this picture at two in the morning, the same time I took the others. And I didn't, you can't really look at it very well with my eyesight until I went home and put it on the computer. I said, wow, here's the, uh, here's the Milky Way. But look up here. I said, what is that? I said, that's gotta be Saturn. So there were a couple of astronomers that I asked and I said, and they said, what time of day? And I said, well, it was two in the morning and I was facing east. He says. Well, that's the Andromeda Galaxy. So here, it's a $1,000 camera, which is pretty cheap. 
is the Andromeda galaxy in the Milky Way. And I, I would imagine I could have seen it with my naked eye, but I didn't know where to look or what I was looking for. So beautiful. This is in um, February. This is when John and I went up there. It's all set up, ready to go for the night. Again, just traveling up the roads. This is how that subomic changed in the winter time. You know, again, I would never walk on the ice by myself, but uh, here we are. We're in the dead of winter. You, you're very, very, it's very cold up there, very cold. It's just a little bling that I think when you do these parks on the air, it's probably a good idea to present yourself well because people are going to not know what you're doing. Quite often, they'll come over and they'll ask a few questions. And if you look professional and you look neat and clean and you're polite, there's no issues, but you, you got to be kind to the people that allow you to come into the parks. I think uh, Pi, I think Pi made me get this number plate, if I'm not mistaken. And these uh, parks on the air, not necessarily would be at a uh, remote site. They could be at a ship. Now, this was not a POTA site. This was the uh, battleship activation last summer. And here's some of the local guys. There's John and uh, this is Mr. Davis. And um, again, they could have a uh, pox on the air and they could be activating this way. It doesn't necess necessarily have to be out in the uh, field. Battery, cell phone for the time, charger. I have a little keypad here that I can push a button and automatically call CQ for me while I'm doing my log. My tuna, my light, light. Head, uh, headlights that you put on over your head at night, uh, inside outside thermometer, and certainly batteries and so forth. This is how this is how deep the snow was when I went in the last time, and this is what made me nervous when uh, when I was up there. You'll see later, it started snowing. So I'm driving in here, and my truck is there's no place to turn around. Actually, I know where I'm going. My bottom of my truck is just barely squeaking by here without bottoming it out. And like Henry said, if you get stuck up here, or if you slipped off the road, you'd be in deep trouble. It would be very expensive, and I don't know how you'd get a hold of somebody quickly. This is just um, just an audio of a, the gentleman up in uh, Alaska. I won't bore you with that. Well, I went up camping here 20 years ago, actually even 30 years ago now, hunting and camping and fishing. And this was a grave from a logger that had no family from many years ago, I guess back in the 20s, and they buried him here. And I was pleased to see his grave was still there you know, here I'm back 20 years later. This is the only hut I saw up there. I, I often said if I didn't buy the ice house, I would cover this with plastic and sleep in there, but never did. And any firewood that I brought, I always leave for the next guy. Again, a beautiful Sabumic Lake. Great place to fish. I think maybe I'm gonna start bringing a fishing pole when I do these activations. Appalachian Trail, uh, K4556. That's a state park all the way from Georgia, all the way up to Mount Katahdin. If you do activate it and you to record it, you got to indicate that you're what state you're in. And uh, this was uh, this was up in Monson, Maine. Uh, the beginning of Lily Bay. This was in December when there was only a foot of snow on the ground. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a regular conversation, but. Uh, It's cold, but you know, if you dress correctly for it, and you know, um, I buy all the synthetic coverings from REI, and I was not really cold other than my uh, hands at sometimes and my feet. This was uh, this was three or four weeks ago when John and I went up there. This is four feet of snow now. This is Moosehead Lake down here, and uh, it had snowed four or five inches when we were up there. 
but this is this is what you have. This is how it draws you up there. You know, other than that, I would never go up there. But if there's a reason to go up there to do an activation, here we are. You know, grab a friend of yours or go by yourself or whatever it might be. It's it's wonderful. It's just paradising. You're always looking for animals. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I was driving down one of the roads on the way out. And this was in the week before Christmas. And it was a snowstorm I was driving out. So I had to get out of there quick. Snow was adding up. There was no plows up there. And I, the windshield's all covered with ice. I don't want to get out and scrape it. I just want to get out of there as fast as I can. And all of a sudden, I got 10 more miles to travel on this dirt road. And I see these two gigantic horses out in the middle of the snowstorm. And I'm looking, I'm saying, boy, this makes no sense. Where the heck would a horse get up? It's so cold out here. I got a little closer and I said, wow, those horses are bigger than my truck. And as I got right up on them, I said, wow, those aren't horses. Those are moose. And uh, two monster moose. I, I didn't have a chance to take any pictures, but they were uh, in the snow and you, you, they're all covered with snow. Uh, again, inside the cabin. This is the uh, little buddy heater. I don't know the cost of it. It's it's probably only a couple hundred dollars. Or it's certainly not anything more than that. And then I put a, a little fan on the top of it. And also on the roof of this, the, uh, the ice house, I have a battery operated fan blowing the, the heat down. And there's vents on either side of the, uh, the ice house here for carbon monoxide. There's a detector on the unit. And I also hang a detector from the ceiling, you know, especially where I'm camping by myself. Uh, this is kind of an interesting video from a friend of mine in England that I work every day on CW, whether it's on 20 or on uh, 40 meters. It's uh, G0DJF and uh, Paul, Paul Griffin. And I speak to a gentleman down in Long Island every day on 20 meters. And needless to say, 20 meters between Massachusetts and New York, as you guys know, is extremely, extremely difficult. And our signals are always 229. And here's my friend in England listening to our conversation. Look at the signals. Well, I won't bore you, but here we are talking back and forth. It looks like we have five, uh, five, seven, nine signals in England, but we can't communicate uh, 50 miles away. Here's the buddy heater, which is paradise in the winter when it's so cold outside. Now I'm on, I'm inside. It's a week before Christmas. It's a foot of snow on the ground and I wake up. At 5 a.m. in the morning, I hear something on the tent. It's ice pellets hitting the tent. I try to go back to sleep at quarter of seven. I look out, and it's snowing out like crazy. And I'm saying, oh, I'm in trouble. I just barely got in here. Hey guys, Whiskey Charlie, 1 November. How you doing? Hey, I'm up here at uh, Sabumic Lake in the wilderness of northern Maine. And uh, I thought I'd hold off. I'm in a rip-roaring snowstorm up here. So uh, I had to drive in on the roads that were uh, not plowed 12 inches deep. So needless to say, I got to pack things up and get out of here. And uh, I've done my activation and I'm happy for that, but uh, no, I don't want to risk staying up here. See you guys later, Whiskey Charlie, one November. See ya. So that brings up uh, Henry's point. You don't want to get stuck up there. There's the ice house. Looks like there's my antenna. That's how low it is to the ground. Um, this is, this happens to be on top of, this is a soda activation. The first one I did, which was a uh, minuscule on uh, Quabbin Hill. And uh, that's, it's like Poda, but you have to be in a designated area, a very, very small, well-defined area in order to operate. You can't be outside the activation zone. Vertically, it's plus or minus 75 feet, but you must be in the zone. And your app on the phone tells you when you're in the zone. I always take a picture when I'm leaving. Uh, so if anybody ever complained about something, I'd say I left it perfectly clean or cleaner when I leave. 
This is uh, the condition I had when I was driving out. When I saw those two moose, just all of a sudden they just appeared in front of me. Unfortunately, I was not able to get a photo. Uh, this was a friend of mine, uh, Chris Billings, and he's located on uh, in Oregon. It's uh, WA7RAR, and he went down to Barbados. First time, it was uh, there's several parks down there. They were ever activated. I believe we worked eight or nine parks, and we both worked a CW for the first time in each and every one of the parks. Every single one of the different days, he called me. And it worked out well. And uh, he's, he's a great operator. He does a lot of polar uh, activations. Great guy. Very nice. Okay. Uh, I don't know what this is. All right, guys. Whiskey Charlie 1 November. Just wishing everybody a Merry Christmas. Out here doing an activation this morning. As you see, there's my, there's my little bit of tower. And it comes down to a 25-foot. Uh, hi, and then uh, 63 feet out for the end fed. Hope to get you guys on frequency. Merry Christmas to all. Every day. I put it in my uh, garage to let it dry out after uh, an activation. I'm just going to play this shot little video. Population trail up in northern Maine. 20 degrees, six inches of snow on the ground. I'm ready to go live and talk to Mark. John Murphy. here at uh, Sabumic Lake in the wilderness of Northern Maine. You know, we're all getting older, so I challenge any and everybody, when was the last time you did something for the first time? You got to spice up your life. Doesn't really cost much. Uh, here's John WI1G with his ice house. He did uh, he did a great job. He's a hunter. He doesn't activate, but he hunts. And here he is. He's got his KX2 down here. He's got a buddy heater somewhere over here. His charger, and he's having great. He's working the Cayman Islands, having a lot of fun with his QRP radio. And he took his arbor. arbor I wait and threw it up in a tree and he had a dipole up there and he was having fun also. Every two or three hours, we'd come out and see each other and say, hey, how are you making out? And we had filters on our radios. He had a, we had a 20 and a 40 meter filter and then we'd interchange and we'd switch frequencies so we didn't have intermod with each other. Worked out perfectly. He's, he's a great operator. Again, this is all the things I said before that we need. And uh, I won't bore you with that again. Um, down to Rhode Island. I mean, this is how strong the wind was, but it's right next to the ocean. It's early in the morning. European stations were just booming in, having a lot of fun. Buddy heater. Uh, this was one of the warmer days when John and I went up there. We saw that warming uh, in the 20s up there uh, is warm. So we had a great time. This was on top of Quabbin Hill. Uh, first time I was doing summits on the uh, air, and I did a two-meter activation, uh, summit to summit, and then I switched over to uh, CW on 40 meters. Uh, this was this was up in... Well, Hello there, guys. Whiskey Charlie, one November. It's had my first summer activation here, and that's located at Coabin Hill. It's uh, the central part of the state. Near Coabin Reservoir behind me. And uh, I think we're only up about 1,100 feet, but a uh, beautiful day. We'll see how it works out. Again, Mr. Charlie, 1 November, wish me luck. See you later. Just a fun time. When you're a chaser, you get points when you're in soda. Just work them. This is uh, my friend again. This was another activation uh, I did in the western part of Mass. Uh, that was uh, a little bit higher. This is what you work with when you're doing a soda. It's cold up there. I got my snow boots on. 
I'm hanging in my knapsack, my 705s in here. You, you don't have a seat because you don't want to carry a chair up, everything you got to carry up. And he is on top of uh, Monadnock last Friday. It was, um, it was a tough climb up and tougher going down. Hello guys, Whiskey Charlie One November. Here it is, the uh, halfway through March, I think, maybe March 11th, if I'm not mistaken. On top of Mount Monadnock, about 3,100 plus feet. Cold, a cold, little windy. Uh, got my uh, head fed all the way down there. Just ready to go live on the solar activation up here. A little windy, a little cold. Not bad, though. So here we go, soda. Whiskey Charlie, 1 November. The first contact I had on this 5 watt 705, this was all 20 pounds worth of gear carrying up on CW. First contact was France. I made 19 contacts that day because I spent 45 minutes there and I got out and it was uh, a tough climb down. I Going down with the ice and the snow, I actually fell four times and uh, I was extremely exhausted when I got down to the bottom. This is what you do with the uh, summits on the air. There's an app on the phone, it tells you when you're in the activation zone. At that time, you can set up, you can see I was at 3130. And uh, I guess if I went to the actual peak, I could have been 43, four, 43 more feet higher. But as long as you're within 75, then this comes alive for the activation zone. Uh, this was a uh, another solder I did in Central Mass. This is my solar activation on Prospect Hill. This is Whiskey Charlie, 1 November. That's my end fed that goes up to a tree that I threw up with an arbor's uh, rope and weight. And it comes all the way down here over to my family, Fallon. And that's the uh, chameleon 63 foot end, foot end fed. Here's my coax. It goes over to my beautiful ham station. By the way, my hands are freezing. I don't know what the temperature is, but the wind is a killer. I, I'm guessing the temperature is 25 degrees with heavy wind. And here we are, 705. Um, little walkie. I haven't had any luck with 5.2 direct. Coax, Kia, and I'm officially on the air. Hope to reach you guys. And again, uh, it's an easy setup, nothing special. QRP, five watts. I've worked in the Europe. So uh, go out and have some fun. Do this yourself. Any questions, certainly ask. Whiskey Charlie, 1 November. And, you know, you can always team up with a buddy or myself or anybody else. If you want to come along, just ask. And you can both do the, uh, the activation at the same time. And uh, at this time, are there, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Maybe we can. Hey, Bob, I wanted to. I wanted to uh, ask you a question here before you sure. uh, get rolling with the general questions. Um, you you want to just explain, uh, you know, when, when you go to, Ed, to do any of these activations, uh, you showed a little bit of the the, the uh, app that's on for when you do summits on the air. But, yeah. uh, you, you know, when you go and you go to a park, whether you announce it ahead of time or not, I, that's, you know, you don't usually do that. But when you show up at a park, can you just, just explain to everybody how easy it is to let people know where you are. And this is why they'll just- Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's a couple different ways of doing it. Um, if you're within Wi-Fi or you're within uh, cell coverage, you basically can go to the park, you can set up your equipment and you can get on the POTA website and you can spot yourself and then people will start calling you. That works out just fine, no issues whatsoever. That's not always the case though, if you're going out in the middle of nowhere like I just showed you. And the, 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 the way we get around that is on the POTUS website, you can actually set up your activation, proposed activations in the future. And it might be, let's say I'm gonna go up there tomorrow. I might say from uh, 1200 Zulu to 1600 Zulu, I'm gonna be on 7059. And then uh, from, from Sabumic Lake, let's just say, or, or uh, Lily Bay and I put the K number, K12345, whatever it might be. 
And then I go off and I go into the wilderness and I can't make contact with anybody. But I've told the POTA website that I'm going to be there. And I start transmitting. Usually after three transmissions of sending CQ, the reverse beacon network, which is a series of receivers all around the world that are uh, connected to the internet, will pick me up, give me a signal report, and then it will immediately spot me on the POTA website. And then I'm off to the races. People know that I'm here now. And that same exact procedure is done with soda. So that's how you get around uh, out in the middle of nowhere without any uh, Wi-Fi or cell coverage. Does that answer your question? That's perfect. That is, that, that's great. And I think I know the answer to this, but has almost all of your operation been 10 watts or less? Uh, no, no. Um, to be quite honest with you, most of it's QRO. Uh, the only time I run low power is when I'm doing soda because carrying the stuff in is, is, it's really tough. Uh, what I do when I go up north, I, I cut down the power, but I don't go QRP. I might, depending on what power I have to operate, I might take it from a hundred Watts down. I've gone CW down to 25 Watts. And, um, the way it works with side band, if I'm at a state park, like for instance, yesterday was the first time West Bridgewater State Forest was indicated on the Porter website. So I left Massasoit after activating that and ran over to West Bridgewater to be the first one to activate. I activated on, on 15, uh, excuse, not 15, but on 17, 30, 20, and 40 all side, all uh, CW. And then I also switched over to side band because there's people that want that pack so badly. And I give them the opportunity for a very short period of time that they can make the contact too. And that's how it works on the side band. I, I cut the power down to probably 50 Watts. It really kind of, you really have to plan ahead because you're eventually going to run out of power. So, you know, you run high power all day long. You're taking a chance. You're going to run out at night. You plan on going to bed at seven o'clock it's dark out and there's not much to do that's a different story but you know you just got to plan ahead how you're going to operate your station bob do you use a buck booster when you're out there uh to keep the power level up uh no what is a buck booster uh well i got one it's uh i've had it for years it uh, keeps your power level at about 13 and a half volts uh until your battery hits around 10 and a half or 11 volts uh and then it then it just shuts right off. Yeah, I, th uh, I think uh, that would work with a dry cell. But I think with a lithium phosphate, if I'm not mistaken, it holds the voltage until it's dead and then it just drops right off. Yeah, I, I just use SLR, uh, SLA batteries. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't use lithium ion phosphate. Yeah, so that's the difference. Uh, if that same procedure you just described did work with my dry cell, and I'm, the only time I bring the dry cell now is for a backup. But that's a good point. That would be a great idea, sure. Yeah. And, you know, everything I'm telling you here, everybody can come up with your own ideas. There's, there's all sorts of, and I'm always, I'm always listening and trying to find a new way. And the next time I do a solder, I'm going to make my pack lighter than 20 pounds. You just learn. Every time you do something, you learn a little bit more. Or you, you watch another video and you say, wow, that's a great idea. I'll try that. You know, and uh, I just challenge anybody to team up with somebody that's done some activations and just say, hey, can I meet you somewhere? Can I see how you're doing it? Bring your chair and go out there and bring your coffee with you and sit down. And, you know, both of you guys operate the radio differently and and just have a ball. It's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. Once, once you uh, once you try it a few times, you'll be addicted. Really. Um, hey, Bob, this is Rick in one D.C. I'm down in Naples, Florida. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine now. Okay. Oh, in the background, I got some noise with the waves, but go ahead. Okay, I got a, a couple questions for you, one of which is uh, related to permitting and access to these parks. Have you ever had to notify the state officials that you're going in there, like a hunter would or someone that was going in on a long hike, for example, just from a safety perspective, so that they know if you don't come out at a certain amount of days or hours that they would go in and look for you? No, the only time I've ever had that happen to me twice Whereas when I climbed Mount Katahdin, and at that time you had to tell them uh, what time you're starting, the route you're taking up and down, 
and your expected time back and then an emergency number. That was the only state park. Other than that, I've never never been exposed to that. And 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 I do tell, like for instance, like I said, WI1G, uh, I usually let him know where it's going on and we try to make schedules that we can make contact. He's been a great support network back at home when I'm out in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, you you, you should you should notify somebody what you're doing, at least uh, in case- um, Another happen. question for you. Um, the manual logging that you're doing on paper, do you convert that to a digital log or one MM or something like that when you get home after I the do. activation? I do, and I do all manual logs, and I and then I use the HAM RS. You know, and a couple of my friends said, "Well, why don't you use a laptop or this or that or your phone?" And you know something, when there's a pile up and people are coming back at you so fast, I'm I don't have the ability to do it. I really don't. I, I copy down the calls and the pileups happen. And then when I go back, I decipher everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask you about also, uh, I, I just had lunch recently with Jerry, KB1NNH, who's uh, from Falmouth. I know Henry knows him and Pi knows him as well. Oh. He, he's getting into POTA down here in Florida. And he's been out at Collier Seminole State Park out in the Everglades. Okay. And uh, I, we had a very interesting conversation at lunch um, last week regarding his last activation out there. And he's gone in there a few times. And most recently, uh, his setup is similar to yours. He uses a, the two-inch receiver on his trailer hitch and uses a, a telescopic mast from Max Gain Systems. It's a, a telescopic fiberglass oh. mast. So that's the center support for his antenna. Yeah. And he uses a dipole sc scenario similar to you. And he was set up in Collier Seminole recently and operating. And all of a sudden, someone came up to him in a state vehicle and tapped him on his shoulder and said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I've, I'm, I'm operating parts on the air. I'm a ham radio operator. I've been here many times and so forth. And the, the lady, the, the state park official that was there, she said, well, you have to remove your antenna supports from the trees. You're not allowed to connect antennas to the, the trees, even though one of them was dead. Now, Jerry had been out there a couple of times previously, never had an issue. So what they told him he needs to do is to support it with something that's man-made. So he's got these uh, electric fence stakes now that you can buy a tractor supply. And that's what he's doing. But he was very surprised that that happened to him. And that was recent, too. That was within the last two weeks. Have well, you ever had any problems like that? I have not had any problems. Uh, I had one problem in New Hampshire. I couldn't, there was a state park on the map that was never activated and I couldn't find it. And I pulled over and there was a gentleman doing yard work and I, I went up and I asked him, do you mind if I ask you a question? I'd like to know where the state park is. Yeah, I know where it is. It's, it's over there, but it's landlocked and you can't get to it. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm doing parks on the air. And he said, well, I don't know anything about parks on the air. And I said, well, that's what I'm doing. I'm here to activate and promote the park. And uh, he was very uncooperative and wouldn't give me any information whatsoever. The only thing I can say with that is, again, you got your hat. You might have your lanyard. You're neat and clean. You're always polite no matter what you do. And um, just do the best you can. Most times... The rangers will come over and after you tell them what you're doing and identify it and, and ask them to come over and listen to the they love it. They're just part of the crowd. I would say 99% of the time, they're just wonderful people to deal with all the time. I had a problem like that with a, a lady ranger at Palmer Pond up in Maine. And uh, she came and I had a, a clothesline hooked to a tree, just simply you know looped around the tree. She came with her knife and stepped up and cut the clothesline and all my clothes fell to the ground, my yeah. dish towels, my clothes. And uh, I said, uh, what are you doing? She said, no clotheslines on the trees. You should know better. It was a federal park. Well, well, just because somebody else has a bad attitude doesn't mean that we should reciprocate with a bad attitude. In, in that case, and, and I have a couple that I bring with me. I bring a couple cement blocks with me. And uh, they work out pretty well, whether I use them for the tent or I use them at the bottom of the antenna. So maybe just grab a couple of cement blocks just for an insurance policy. I tied on the trees today. I, I do it pretty much every day. 
every day. One end is usually my truck with a rope and the other end is the tree. And um, I, I never had any problem yet. You know? I think it's one of these deals that, you know, you get all the permits. I have a permit that I use for the whole year. And when you go up to the main parks, uh, they have canisters that you put your money and your name in a, a metal canister. And what I do is I take a photograph of it first. So if anybody ever stopped me, I can prove that they did it. And I've run into mostly all good people. But I understand it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're always going to run into a few bad apples. But just don't reciprocate back to them. Just be, just be, take the high road and be better than they are and be nice to them. And you'll have better results. Yeah. Any other oh, questions? Great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, Rick. Uh, is any other questions across the board? Anything we can improve on the next time you think, guys, or not? I hope so. Somebody so, put anybody so, so Bob, I, Bob, you know, I, I uh, <laughs> I've, I've had a few activations, nothing at all uh, in the quantity that you have, and I've done all all local ones here, but I just want to stress how you obviously showed just how how simple it can be as far as getting your signal on the air, but it, it's it's so simple to uh, I, I just like to advise everybody to give give a try at some, like Wampatuck State Park. Sure. I'm thinking of things that are right in our area sure. or Fort Revere. I mean, one of the best best views that you yeah. can think that you can think of and just drive there, pull over. Uh, and, and if you want to use a whip on your car, even so much easier, uh, you're on the air, you're activating a park. And, and you know, uh, if you make what I think, what is it? If you make 10 contacts, it's now an official activation. Yeah. And um, the only thing that you need to do beyond that is to uh, record them, as you, you were saying, you transfer them over and then upload them so that it gets into the system sure. where people can say, hey, yeah, I worked that official activation and uh, now I've worked that park. So it is so simple. And and I just want to stress when you say do something new, if you're if you're someone that has not activated a park, it's a good thing to I, I think that will be a good, good New Year's resolution uh, to at least do one. Do it once just just to see what it's like. And I think I think you'll find that you will want to do it more than once. Well, you know, team up with a friend or. If somebody wants to meet me at a park, I do it every day. Uh, we can find something on the weekend or whatever. Just come on over, grab your chair. It'll probably be a little bit nicer when it's warmer. And uh, sit back and enjoy it. And I'll let you take the station over, whether you want to do side to, side band or CW. And uh, you'll have a ball. It, um, it, it is a lot of fun. And you, you can do it certainly by yourself, but you can do it uh, with a friend. When I set up my stations every day, on my stations, I can set it up in less than 10 minutes and I'm on the air. It's that quick. The antenna, tie to a tree, tie to my truck, coax. I have a RF choke on the end of the coax. And um, tuna, radio, power supply, bing, bing, bing. And after a while, you get all the connectors so everything works out well and it's not a hodgepodge. You can get on the air very quickly. And the same thing on teardown. It's that, that, that great. And um, yes, that's correct, Pi. 10 contacts on Boda. If you do a soda, you only need four contacts because it's a, a lot harder doing a soda. And that, uh, if you're on top of a mountain, you could go up there and you could do it on 5-2 direct. And a matter of fact, the first one I did was at uh, Quabbin Hill. And I started off with 5-2 direct. And needless to say, I made nine contacts on 5-2 direct. And I, and I had my activation made before I even went on the low frequencies. So a lot of fun. Question, Bob? Yes, sir. When you do uh, the powder parks on the air, and I, and I heard you say that one of the parks, it was uh, a real small area, and you used an app on your phone to find out the, the coordinates to that location. What app are you using on the phone? Okay, that particular um, subject I was talking about was soda summits on the air. And that is the, uh, it's called the GOAT app. Let me just see what exactly the, the correct word that I'm giving you correctly on that. It's, uh, it's called uh, soda GOAT. And what that does, it tells you the exact location uh, for the soda. Now, you said POTA. POTA, as long as you're, and you can look on the POTA website for the definition. As long as you're inside the gates and you're in there during the open 
uh, time period, uh, then you are an official activation. And there's many parks that never close their doors. Some of them don't even have gates on there. Some of them don't have ranges. And I've done many uh, late shift. That means after uh, zero hundred hours and uh, you're all set for the next day if you want to do it every day. So um, you can always find a park to do it. You know, if, if I failed at Borderland, uh, I could run over to another park and still get it done before zero hundred hours to meet my daily requirement that I've set forth for myself. Yeah, Bob, the Appalachian Trail would be a national park also, but the entire trail is a national park. And you said you have to just tell them what state you're in in order to activate. Yeah. Right. But, uh, but the other thing is you might want to tell everybody how many days in a row. I, I lost track from the other day when you asked, uh, when you asked uh, Alexa how many days has it been since whatever the first date was. You must be at 235 or 40 by now, 200, and I don't know. Alexa, how many days has it been since July 14th, 2021? July 14th, 2021 was 243 days ago. 243 days. <laughs> there you go. Every, every day, every day for 243 days, he's activated. And, and, I, I, think, and, I, and I think I want to commend Bob because uh, we've become good friends over the last year or so and more. And he... Uh, he always tries to, although he loves CW, he always tries to do some sideband. And if you if you do nothing more than just listen to Bob run an activation, he he gets everybody in line so they don't jump over each other, although they still might do that. And he gives them all a chance to get in, and he does it in an orderly way. It's amazing. It, he's got everybody lined up and ready to go. It's amazing. This is how I, and that's a good point too. This is how I handle a, uh, a pileup. I'm calling CQ, people are coming back to me. I'm working them back and forth, back and forth. And all of a sudden there's a pileup. You know, whatever it might be, the word has got out, this pack's never been activated. I'll say, um, this is Whiskey Charlie 1 November. At this time, I'm gonna listen for 20 seconds, very carefully. I'm gonna listen to the strong stations. I'm gonna listen to the weak stations. I promise you, I'm gonna write everybody's call down. I'm gonna call you all back. Your job is to be polite to one another, space them out, try not to be the first one, and please do not repeat your call more than once. At this time, QRZ the frequency, Whiskey Charlie 1 November. <clears throat> Let it go. And then I start copying all the calls down. Usually they're pretty good. And then I call everybody back in an order. I won't take any additional people to jump in. I'll just tell them to stand by. When I'm all done, everybody's happy. And it's, it's got some order to the, and there's no chaos. And the QRP stations are recognized as well as the QRO and any park to parks, they get priority. The QRP gets second priority and then uh, individuals get the last. And, and certainly mobiles get priority. There's only few and far between in the mobiles. Yeah. And uh, it's also one other simple thing when you log in guys, a lot of times you'll copy a call down and for whatever reason, you know, it could be the band conditions. We got a woodpecker coming on recently on 40 meters, uh, probably caused from the wall like they had down in Cuba, I, I guess. I'm not 100% sure. Nobody knows. But later in the day, uh, four o'clock and on on 40 meters, the woodpecker jamming has been wiping out 40 meters. So um, it's important when you get somebody's call you really want to make sure that you copy down the state also, because quite often I'll receive a call and it might be, uh, I might have copied an M, let's say da da, and it was really a G, da da did or whatever it might be, something a little bit off the ordinary. And then by knowing the state and it doesn't match up with the call, then you start thinking, was that an S or was that an H? And everyone's <laughs> Every once in a while, you have to track it down, you know, because you, you'll, you'll be doing your activation, you'll copy all the calls, and then there's one call that doesn't exist, and it's because I copied an H and it was really an S, or vice versa. So it's, uh, and you really want to try to make sure you give the uh, hunters uh, all their credit. So I, I put the, a lot of people say, just eliminate it, you got so many, who cares? I do care about every contact. And uh, 
that's that's when you're an activator. You you should take responsibility so they get credit for it. So everybody's treated fairly. One additional item, if you, if, I don't expect that many of us are going to get as active as Bob is, but if you do get active and you have a real busy day, uh, the real work starts when you get home because you've got to enter all of those call signs unless you're doing it on the fly. You've got to enter them all into the into the POTA website to give recognition to all the hunters. The hunters are easy. You can you can be a hunter all day. You get recognized. The activator is the one that has to go home and put all of those call signs and all the information into the computer. And I think I talked to Bob. It's a number of months ago now. He had hundred. He said it just started. I'm going to be all day entering this data because he had so many contacts. And it, and so there's a lot of work if you're going to make the commitment. There's a lot of work to do. When I go that, is, away, that is a very, very good logging program, though, that they have uh, established there. That's that's very very handy. And you have to. And the the logging program every once in a while has glitches in it too. And if you see a glitch, report it immediately. I had one. Uh, they just had a new software update three days ago. And I noticed from uh, 1,500 Zulu to 1,800 Zulus, it wouldn't allow you to put the correct time in. So I immediately contacted the uh, software gentleman that handles it, and they corrected it right away. Within uh, less than 24 hours, it was uh, corrected again. So every once in a while, there's a little glitch, and don't be afraid to contact them because they're very responsive, responsible on uh, HAM RS. And on your PC or your Mac at home, it's free. On your iPhone, I think it's four ninety nine. It's a great little app. So, well, does anybody else have any any questions here for Bob? And Bob, maybe tell you what. Why don't you um, uh, sign off with your give us your if you, you if you would your contact info so that if anybody uh, thinks of a question later on or, or or is viewing this on the recording and would like to get, get in touch with you and just ask you a a question, maybe you could give us your contact info. Sure. Well, certainly you can. Your email that, address? Yeah. You can use flysafe at me.com. That's my email, flysafe at me.com. And if you guys want to look at some additional pitches, it'd be I love poda.com. I bought that URL and I bought the I love soda.com URL. And then I have a little personal website that I, I share with you guys and anybody can use. It's basically all the links on there with everything to do with ham, ham radio. And it's bestineaston.com. I live in the town of Easton. Bestineaston.com with no spaces. And you're welcome to use anything on that. It has everything on it. Everything. It has the soda. It has the powder. It has the propagation. Everything you want to do with ham radio. So it's, it's a great little look up instead of just searching through the internet, everything's right on one page. And on those pages, if you, uh, you see something, you say, well, this could be a lot better if you did this, just drop me a line, I'll change it up and everybody will uh, benefit from it. Okay, very good. Well, now the fact that you had bought the I Love Soda website, uh, I'm guessing that a requirement might be that you are gonna have to get a goat. I don't know if you've really looked into that or not, but. Uh, that's, well, it, was, it was remarkable that day we had the conversation and then five days, five minutes later, you took a picture of you and a goat. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was just, it was just kind of a funny thing. It really was. I, I saw, you saw the picture of the goat. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, this is the baby right here. That was in, um, in response to a pie telling me I had to have a goat. And then Mike Davis swears up and down. I still got him in the back of my truck. <laughs> so we have a lot of oh, well. Thanks very much, Bob. We really okay. We, great. We really we really appreciate it. And uh, obviously, you have really uh, have quite a love for this. And I hope I hope your enthusiasm has uh, we've been able to pass that pass that along to uh, to the others that have seen it now live and that may be seeing it after. It's yeah, recorded. team up with a friend. Thanks and again. We'll have some fun. We got the summer's coming up and just ask me or ask another guy that's out there. We'd love to share this uh, exciting experience with you. And it's all about ham radio and having good, clean, honest fun. It really is. And it's a relax, relaxing atmosphere too. Great. Well, th thank you. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, 
uh, putting you're, up with my nagging, Bob, to uh, to get you to do this. Too. Well, you're, you're the mother hen around here, so you guide us all through all the challenges. I don't know what we'd do without you, Pi. You're you're great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bob. Okay, thanks. Right, I'll turn turn it over to Marty here if you want to uh, uh, sign things off. But uh, but we have it was great. Really, really a lot of information in there, and you can your your enthusiasm really shows through, Bob. And uh, you've got you've got a wonderful attitude for it. You gotta stay positive. Remember, like I say, when was the last time you did something for the first time? We're all get everybody I see on the screen. We're all getting older, so let's uh, let's enjoy our life while we can. Absolutely. <laughs>